Uh, very good evening to you all. Welcome to Manhattan. This is Times Square behind me. And for the next seven weeks, we'll be discussing what they make of us and what we make of them. Now, don't be deceived by all those gaudy colors back there. There's only one color in this city, and it is orange. Orange alert at the moment. Uh, you can almost feel the fear, and uh, I suppose, I wonder, perhaps the hysteria as well. Now, I've got a, uh, the perfect panel to discuss all this on my... Right over there, Rick MacArthur, the publisher and president of Harper's Magazine, also a bit of a critic of the media in the last Gulf War. Uh, to my left, as it were, Neil Ferguson, the historian of Star, clearly, a historian of finance, but also a historian who takes the broad, broad sweep, sees the big picture. Formerly of Oxford University, currently of New York University, of NYU here. Uh, to my right here, Samantha Power, a lecturer in the Kennedy School of Government, at Harvard. She covered the fall of the former Yugoslavia for The Economist. And to my left here, Anne Coulter, a lady with views and not the best known liberal in the city, but certainly strong views. <laughs> I was talking earlier about uh, hysteria. What you do notice out there is that it's empty. Is that cold or fear? What's going on? Um, the city is definitely aware that we're under an orange alert and that the terrorists know New York is a better place to hit than most other places in America, but I'd say the, the city's holding up more resolutely than the French, and they're not under attack. <laughs> Let's yeah. forget the French for a moment. So that, you know, we can come back to them. Why do you well, think... I don't think it's hysteria, in other words. I mean, people are taking reasonable measures. I think they're not going places that are, that are optional, They're taking the subway for random reasons. I mean, it actually is pretty busy down there. It's, it's quite empty for Times Square, um, but, but there are a lot of people there. Uh, on the corner of 1st Avenue and 11th Street, where I live, I talked to a very intelligent man, who, uh, a chap who sells the rugs. I you know, talked to him every week, and he said he'd spent the week putting polythene, putting plastic over his windows. And I said, what on earth are you doing that for? And he said, biological attack. So what's going on? There is a kind of a nuttiness in this city at the moment. Well, I, I don't think it's nutty. It's a very small, small percentage, I think, chance that... For one thing, that there would be a serious attack again, and the odds are overwhelming. If there is another attack, you either die instantly or you live. But there is a very, I mean, there is a possibility that there would be a radioactive gas or something out there. And, you know, if it's no skin off your back, why not put up plastic on the window? I, I mean, I don't think people are reacting hysterically. I think they recognize it's a very small percentage. Why do I feel more frightened in this city now than I did after the attacks? There's a, there's, a, there's a thought in my mind that it's being got up by the government for their own purposes on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, I, don't, I don't think that is true. I'm, I don't, so, I'm not much of cynical? a conspiracy that... buff myself, <laughs> and any conspiracy that involves more than three people, I must say I tend to look on very unfavorably. So, no, I would not believe that. They're probably not telling us everything they know, but the last time we had an alert like this it was right before the anniversary of September 11th, and they arrested the cell in Buffalo. Rick, what uh, you make of that? I, I feel like I'm living in the middle of an advertising campaign, actually. Uh, the orange alert makes me think of Tide detergent. And when I saw the uh, spokesman for the Pentagon yesterday on television a couple of days ago, Tori Clark, talking about freshening her stockpile of anti-terrorist uh, uh, provisions, I thought, well, that's a great sales uh, technique. Uh, there's a cynical political motive behind this, of course, which is to get the How country on a I mean, to, to get know. to get the war to get the country on a war footing. I mean, they canceled the the per, they won't give a permit for demonstrations against the war uh, this weekend. The, 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 there's a whole completely different concert. There's, no, it's a concerted effort to get people uh, into a panic, into a lather. And as far as I can tell, all it's doing is selling duct tape. I'm not sure that people are really panicked. I do see. Plenty I mean, of people out be, on the street. You, that, you're not saying that the threat yeah. isn't real, surely. There are the seriously threat, the, mad people out there the, bent on maximum destruction. Yeah, but why is the threat more real today than it was uh, six months ago or three months ago? It's because we're on the verge of invading oh, Iraq. Yeah. And we want people to shut, yeah. shut up and shut down. And, and there's a big demonstration planned this Saturday, which they've tried to circumvent by not giving a, a permit for marching down First Avenue in front of the UN. It's, it's real. I mean, believe me, matter, believe me the, the government, the, the, the country is, is run by advertising and public relations strategy more than, than at any time in my, my, my life. Have you changed your life, the routine of your life in any way? No, although I, 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 did, I did take a cab down here. I, I jumped into the car service. I rushed in 
because there was a wild rumor that they were searching uh, cars in Times Square. Maybe it's not a wild rumor. And now when I get down here, I see the cops with their machine guns and so on and so forth. But to me, it looks like a stage set uh, more than a genuine terrorist alert, an advertising campaign. No for, twinge for invading of genuine Iraq. fear in you. No, no, no. My fear is about some kind of big civil liberties crackdown. I mean, I, I'm not uh, yeah. that nervous about it, actually. But I, I know the history of the United States, and I know the history of the Palmer raids in 1919, the McCarthy period. I think it's perfectly conceivable that we're going to go through another big civil liberties crackdown in this country. I think there's one problem with this argument, if I could come in here, Rick. Sure, and by, that is that means. this government has more to worry about with respect to the economy than almost anything else. Well, that's why we, they want to sell duct we, tape. Well, exactly. <laughs> Selling duct tape is not actually going to bring about any significant economic <laughs> recovery. And, whereas if they really ha were exaggerating the extent sure. of the threat, uh, they, they, they'd be shooting themselves in the foot because, as Alan Greenspan said just the other day, one of the principal reasons for economic trouble in the U.S. at the moment is anxiety about uh, terrorist threats and, and war. So I don't see that there's any reason why the government has an interest in doing this. I think, in fact, it's much oh, more contraire. plausible that there as we is. Say in uh, th I think it's much more plausible that the genuine, especially is in a, a country threat. ablaze with war fever. Well, I think they want to prepare <laughs> us for war, and, yeah. and it's if happening very soon. Since so. January. Yeah. Yeah. Point, isn't it? Yeah. If, if Mr. Bush is worried about elections. The economy the election will be isn't what, for two years. This but, makes but, no sense. Well, uh, all right, whatever. The economy is what we'll do, uh, we'll, we'll do for him. And more fear now is going to take the rug out from under the travel industry, from under this city, whatever. Well, he's ready to risk that because if he's ready to risk invading Iraq, you're going to see a complete shutdown of the travel industry like we did during the Gulf War. It's going to be a disaster, absolute disaster. So, um, I happen to be afraid uh, and... Uh, more afraid than I've ever been, um, not on the basis of the threat, although I do think that, there, that history uh, indicates that when Osama makes a threat or Osama's clone makes a threat on videotape, something t tends to happen, you know, within a few days of that threat. So I think, you know, he's kind of two for two or three for three on that, I think, by now. But what scares me is the aloneness of the United States uh, as it goes forward. And I, and this is... Alone without Mr. Blair? Surely not. Oh, well, the 51st <laughs> state, indeed. But, but I think that, you know, one of the problems now with the United States barreling ahead on, on the heels of not just the, its foreign policy since 9-11, but really on the heels of a decade of exempting itself from international institutions and treaties and all the like, is that there's just a sense that there's nothing legitimate about what's going on as we go forward and that we make the rules. Well, hold on a minute. This, this man, Mr. Bush, is going through the United Nations. He is consulting absolutely everybody. And everybody is aware <laughs> that he will go well, ahead regardless <laughs> of what the, what the outcome is. No, but I, I say this just in the context of fear, not another sort of lament about how unilateral we are and, and uh, but he's, but how well But it's not we unilateral. Are. But it is a unilateral visitation of a multilateral institution. Uh, absolutely, there's no, there's the rules, absolutely. You know? I mean, it's been it's been clear uh, from the start that this is the the progression, and whoever will come along will join us. But I mention it not because of some fetishization of the United Nations Security Council, which is one of the more undemocratic and anachronistic institutions on the earth, but rather um, that the United States foreign policy, the sort of blazing ahead. Um, and, and sort of be damned, you know, where the world is, makes me feel very, very vulnerable because it feels like if it's not this week, and if it's not next week, and if it's not here, but rather, uh, you know, a U.S. embassy abroad, that the inevitability of the collective uh, sort of anti-Americanism around the world, that we, we are not draining the swamp, we are filling the swamp. Uh, with resentment, and I think that it's there's some number of apocalyptic nihilists who are going to be against us just simply because of our power, but there's some number of people out there that are that are converted to the cause because of not who we are, but because of what we're doing, and I think we have to be very careful. Do you think, Neil, that it's being got up by the government? If not quite got up by the government, certainly they're laying it on with a trowel. Well, I don't think actually that for a minute. I mean, it seems to me perfectly clear that Al Qaeda poses a sure. serious threat to the security of this country and the United Kingdom. Uh, and it's perfectly clear that you don't surround Heathrow Airport 
uh, with tanks uh, just for the sake of boosting morale. In any case, it's complete eyewash because morale would be boosted uh, the moment the war began, certainly uh, in Britain. And the United States is, is far from being a country teetering on the brink of a pacifist wave, <laughs> only if you spend all your time in New York uh, in the company of good uh, uh, hand-wringing liberals. Could you think for a minute <laughs> that no, there's no, anxiety about wrong. the hand wrong. The hand-wringing liberals are very hawkish these yeah, days. Yeah. You've got it all wrong. The, the, well, the, the they've turned really their <laughs> wrong hands into <laughs> fists, but they're in a minority The New York still. Times and the Washington Post are essentially pro-war, and that's supposed to be the liberal media. That well, right wingers so, are always then complaining about. Why do you think the government is ginning this up? What is the government You're conceding yourself that the entire well, country is for this <laughs> war, so why do you think the alert is a fake no, to gin up support for war? No, you admit everyone supports. There's a substantial minority <laughs> yeah, against not, the war. Not and in Britain. Could, and there is a, uh, sorry. Are they paying yeah. attention to the orange alert? He's no, claiming no, we I mean, have the, a phony but, orange no, alert no, out of no, this vast but, government but, conspiracy no, no, to get no. Americans to support war with Iraq. He just admitted no, it's, no, it's, America supports war with no, Iraq. No, there's a substantial minority that doesn't support it. We have a conspiracy. We have a pointless it. conspiracy. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a, well, that's it's, what I'm wondering, it's a, actually. It's an advertising I mean, does, does, does a jacked up fear, justified or not, actually uh, increase support for war, or does it make people think, well, hold on a minute, this is serious? I think, I, don't the think it makes a I think the president increases support for war when he makes a plausible right. case for war, as he did, I think, in his State of the Union address. I, frankly, the idea that the orange alert has something to do with boosting uh, military preparedness is just fantasy. Uh, it seems to me far more plausible that there have been some genuine intelligence uh, 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 reasons for making an increase in security, and one can only hope that these efforts are successful. And the problem is that it's extremely difficult, uh, even with the best security and surveillance techniques in the world to prevent right. the bomber from getting through or the, you know, whatever you care to right. say. And I'm very reminded uh, as a historian by the, the mood that occasionally gripped uh, uh, this country and, and, and Britain, uh, the mood of panic during the Cold War <coughs> and also on the eve of the Second World War, the belief that the bomber would always get through, that London would be levelled within days. Remember, it's widely believed that the London would be completely flattened within days of war breaking out with Germany. In the same way, there was extraordinary levels of paranoia at various times during the Cold War. And people respond to these periodic panics uh, in ways which are semi-rational. They feel, because when people are afraid, they need to try and impose control on their lives. They need to feel that they're not powerless. That's so they tape. go and get duct well, tape. But of course they're powerless. We have no way of predicting where Al-Qaeda will strike next, well, then other than through our intelligence that? Isn't this services? tins of peaches in the 1960s? during the, the Cuba crisis. We're all told to prepare for nuclear war, and the, and, and the true answer is you can't prepare for it, so let's not pretend. No, I, I think one should pretend. I think it's extremely important that people should have some kind of strategy for coping with the completely impossible task of predicting where and when the terrorists will strike, strike Which next. Makes you the, it makes you the perfect American consumer, the perfect target for an American advertising campaign. That's, I don't that's, need an advertising no, yeah. campaign, uh, Rick, with all due respect. I don't think it's really going to boost uh, up the economy need, and buy duct I do not need an advertising <laughs> campaign to believe the threat of terrorism is real. A, because in 9 credible. 11, we saw not an advertising campaign, but the most successful but terrorist outrage in all can, history. I have to ask I, you, seriously, as a, again. as a historian, or just as a, an observer, a keen observer of current events, how can you de link the imminent war with Iraq from what's going on now? It's just not plausible to think that it's completely independent. Well, it depends reason, you what you mean by link it. If what you mean link it, I answer this if what you mean by link it. The reasons are perfectly obvious, Rick. If you would only pay attention. The build up to war. response to that. One, there is no economic rationale behind creating a false panic in this country. Two, there is no need to bolster morale in this country with respect to a war against Iraq. Yes, there is. Because there is perfectly There's still opposition. A majority of insignificant. You yourself admit This is what always happens at dinner parties. The men talk the whole time. <laughs> you yourself admit. <laughs> 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 always happens. You'll be very, very quiet. Let, 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 let me stop you. Right. Right. Let, no matter let, how you get to jump in, let's the men just keep talking. Let's move on a bit. I mean, you mentioned earlier the difference between the two sides of the Atlantic and perceptions of fear. People bang on a lot now about the special relationship between Britain and your country. Do you think it's real? Do you think we get anything out of it? What do you think we get out of it, the Brits you, get out of it? I think you get Tony Blair out of it, which is quite enough. I think mean? you should How be very mean? pleased with, that you have I'm such a strong mean. leader. It's striking, um, it, it seems to me, as an American, but that the Tony French Blair and the Germans have got strong leaders. is the single 
No. Uh, you, I mean, <laughs> no, Mr. they Blair, don't actually. Mr. Blair does not come from the special relationship. He's not. He's not created by it. So what do we actually get what, out of what it? What I was going to say about Tony Blair is that I think is striking and something that is completely absent from this country is that he shows it's possible to be a liberal and also a patriot, and he doesn't care about public opinion. Public opinion will come around after we win this war, and the name for that is leadership, and we don't have that in a lot of countries. And it's. I mean, to keep citing Germany as France as if that's you know all of Europe, they're acting unilaterally at this point. We've got 30 countries on our side. No argument. But what do we actually get out of this special relationship? Vulnerability. To the contrary, we, we get defense. We get defense. You get more vulnerable. I mean, and that's where the opposition is coming from. It's not merely a kind of knee-jerk uh, sort of anti-American opposition in Britain. It's a sense of, my God, if we throw our lot in with these guys, Al Qaeda is coming for us too. We're all in this together. That's what. Well, I'm glad that's FDR what didn't means. say that about Churchill and, and absolutely and but, Hitler's but storming it is through true. Poland. It is a fact. You don't have this to. This is an attack on the West, and I wouldn't assume that London is immune from that. What do you think? The that, that we get out of this special relationship? Well, not terribly many tangible things, and that's been true for a long time. It was extremely important in both the First World War and the Second World War to pers persuade the United States to take, take Britain's side, <coughs> and that's what the special relationship delivered then. What it's delivered since 1945 is much harder to say because from 1945 onwards, the, the Americans systematically dismantled the British Empire and reduced uh, Britain to client state status. And I think one has to be absolutely candid about that. The special relationship is really a great deal better for the United States than it is for Britain, which is left in a kind of limbo between uh, the United States, between NAFTA, which it can't join, and the European yeah. Union, which it's hesitant about being a part of. However, I think there are some intangibles, which if I were Blair, I would be uh, interested in. It certainly enhances his international standing to be best mates with the most powerful power uh, in town. And I think one can't underestimate the temptations to a British Prime Minister, given the choice between, let us say, Berlin, Paris on the one side, sure. and Washington on the other, to, uh, to, go, to opt for Washington. But there's a danger as well, isn't there, uh, for him? And that is that people say the trains don't work and there he is in Washington again. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's the risk How do you he's think already the trains running. will run when they're being blown no, up just, by just, terrorists? Just, do I'm, you understand that you have terrorists at war with the West right now? I mean, this idea that you want some sort of special trading privilege I'm thinking, or I'm something. thinking of the benefits or, or, or the, uh, the losses for Mr. Blair. You would Blair like back him to be more like Chirac and be Saddam Hussein's lapdog? <laughs> I'm is, is that what, what you're going I'm for? Just, I'm just wondering... I mean, is it better well, to have first, a special relationship with George Bush or Saddam no, Hussein? I'm not saying anything about any of that. I'm just wondering if there is such a thing as a special relationship, and if there is, whether we get anything out of it. Yeah, you get, you get I, I can't imagine out looking out for it. something you, you, out of it. You're you, you, standing you, up for the West. You get back into Iraq. I mean, the British invented Iraq. It's a completely British invention. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's a completely abstract concept uh, that was drawn by uh, the... British and the French at Versailles. And so, uh, and it was designed specifically, which is why I call Bush, Bush of Arabia. It was designed specifically to give the British the best portion of the oil fields. And so this gets Tony Blair in back into the Middle East through the back door. I suppose. I think that's a, I mean, about I the most implausible thing you've said tonight I think it's in like a competitive field. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. clearly a, absolutely yeah. no use at all to, to Tony Blair to, to re-establish the British Empire in the Middle East. Not it the wasn't, Empire, uh, but uh, some concession. One, one, one he gets to, paid one not something. To point out he gets that, paid something One, one not to point out, Rick, that uh, when <laughs> Iraq, when it did become a belated colony, was one of those few colonies which didn't uh, do anything but cost money. It was a really rather disastrous <laughs> undertaking ru running Iraq and, and the security costs. Uh, greatly outweighed the benefits. Um, so I think that's not really the reason that, that Mr. Blair is involved in it. And I think the last thing he really would want would be to have any long-term British commitment of resources uh, to establishing a democratic order no, uh, in Iraq. No, but when they, when they cut the up point. the oil again, when they divide up the oil contracts, it's a ter terrific, terrific thing for... Yeah. You, the Brits. Yeah. Well, I've already Don't said, worry. I think it, it, it... I actually agree with, with Anne that it's a there's very, very principled stand on Blair's uh, part. I don't think it's cynical. I'm not, I'm not worried about that. I'm, I'm wondering what the people watching you will actually get in terms of lower taxes or... Are you talking about hospitals? Americans or no, are you no. talking about Brits? The British. What do we get out of I it? I think they get duct tape. I can see what you get out of they it. They get duct tape. And, uh, and, and they get fear and they get a sense that they're thrown in with a lot and that the anti-Americanism that pervades in the world is now going to be anti-Anglo-Americanism. And um, I don't think they get much. I think if I could say what, what we get from Blair, um, we get an individual who is trusted on the left uh, in, in this country um, for a whole host of reasons. As it were. 
We, we get, no, I think he has, he has legitimated, controls. he has helped in addition to the muteness of the Democratic Party, but he has, has really helped legitimate the war domestically. He also, I think, carved out a slot. Um, for a long time, it was just Blair and Bush, Blair and Bush, or Bush and Blair. And he carved out a slot and kept it open such that these, the Eastern European countries and others have been able to sort of latch on. And I think domestically, it, it, we really do notice that Blair is with us. And I think it makes us feel that the effort. Another, we've got another Christian fundamentalist on our side. Terrific. I don't he think reminds Blair is me, a Christian Blair, fundamentalist. Blair reminds me of John Knox with a winning smile. I mean, it's a messianic kind of thing. We're leaving out the whole issue of political hubris and the glory that Blair expects to derive from being on the winning team here. Uh, how can you maybe, leave out political maybe, ambition, short-sighted political maybe he ambition? Maybe just believes it's right. He but does maybe believe also, it's right, and it grows out of Kosovo. Maybe he's also a little crazy, a little crazy. But he believes it, <laughs> and, and he, it grows out very much of the doctrine that he and Cook articulate in order to defend the intervention in Kosovo, which was very much at their urging, where the Clinton administration just came along, sure. tagging along in that a instance. A good, strong, moral stand. He believes this is a, a righteous foreign and policy, and it has to do with Saddam's human rights record. Okay. And he believes that, he is a, that his country is a vulnerable country because of the the threat that the terrorists pose and that this is a way of decapitating a, a monster domestically and internationally. I think he believes that. Isn't there a sense, Anne, that everybody thinks they have a special relationship with the U.S.? Blair goes down to Crawford, uh, Fox goes down to Crawford and, and uh, Bush says, the Mexicans, our southern neighbors, special relationship. The Japanese go in there, well, of course, it's the Pacific. And that's the trick you're playing. You make everybody think they're special. Everybody can't be special. Um, I assure you the Germans and French are not special right now. Um, and moreover, I mean, there are different sorts of special relationships. When you ask that question in the context of 9-11, I think all Americans realized immediately after 9-11, we can count on Britain, we can count on the Australians. I thought we could count on the Canadians, and the English-speaking Canadians we can count on. It's the French-speaking ones we're having trouble with. But yeah, this is the English-speaking world against a bunch of savages. And the idea that this is just America's <laughs> problem is absolutely ludicrous. I mean, look, looking for some sort of tax break out of this, it's a, Blair is protecting, helping protect the West, including England, from savages blowing up your buildings. It's a special relationship as long as we play ball, as long as the, po as, as long as the poodle walks politely. Um, yeah, it's the same relationship Chirac has with Saddam Hussein. <laughs> Let's move on a bit. I mean, to, to the reason we're all here, to the Twin Towers. Two designs will... Uh, replace those Twin Towers down there on Ground Zero, about two miles uh, <clears throat> down 7th Avenue. We've got uh, Daniel, uh, Studio Daniel Liebeskin's Sky Garden, as it's called. It's a spire, a third of a mile high, with different climate zones and a garden that goes up to the sky. Uh, it will be very tall indeed. It will go through these zones, as I say, but the base, the foundations of Ground Zero, that bare stone will be kept as it was, as a memorial. And then the great rival, the two latticework towers of the Think Studio, based here in New York. Again, very, very high, a little bit, uh, not quite as high as uh, Liebeskin Sky Garden, but, but high anyway. Uh, reminiscent, it seems to me, of the Twin Towers and this strange, strange idea, it seems to me, of museums where the planes actually hit, on the levels where the planes actually hit. Um, I'm interested in, uh, to know what you make of either of these. Rick. Uh, I, I'm against all of them. I think it should be a, a public park. Uh, I, I really think the, the most appropriate use of the space is non-commercial with a nice memorial to the people who died there. I think that's uh, the most, you know, honorable way to, to deal with it. If you uh, get into architectural uh, grandiosity and you try to make a statement that somehow um, compensates for the loss of these massive structures, it'll be both an architectural failure and it will be a political failure, ultimately. I think the best thing to do is to show respect for the dead. And that's, that's what I would do. Samantha. Well, I just think it's the American way to respect the dead and to build and to rebuild and to uh. take control, just as duct tape is an effort to take control. <laughs> so with building big buildings, my, my own problem with it, I would do exactly what you suggest, but, but is, is that I think it inflicts a, a kind of moral hazard on the people who would have to work in the building. The rest of us are sort of weighing in, and we think the most appropriate symbol or, you know, sort of business uh, plan is, and none of us are going to be up on the 85th floor working there, because I think it's a not. ripe target for the rest of time. Um, um, I think a little park where people go to weep lacks something in the way of 
angry indignation. So no, I think it should be an enormous, fabulous, would you, monumental would you work there? skyscraper. Would you work yes, there? Yes, I think, it, like planes right now, I think it would be one of the safest places to be in the world. I mean, it's not going to go up for seven years, and I think the swamp's going to be cleared by then. You do? Don't you think you're defying people, almost begging people to have another go? I, um, I, I admire your respect for the noble hard hat, but even they can't get up. <laughs> a structure like the Twin Towers in at least seven years, maybe ten years, and I don't think we're going to be worrying about Wait, and how does terrorism this anymore. Get, how does this Neil, what do you make of it? Oh, I couldn't possibly express an opinion on this Why for else? two reasons. One, I'm a complete Philistine when it comes to architecture. I'm almost completely blind to the merits and demerits of buildings, <laughs> unlike uh, like, like Prince Charles and the other people here. But also, having only lived in New York for three weeks, I think it would be intensely presumptuous of me to suggest oh, what know. the appropriate way would be <laughs> to your commemorate it. Yeah. Any views on height <clears throat> and about whether... Uh, I wish I were taller. I really, <laughs> I really do. <laughs> I mean... Uh, yeah. Mohammed Atta, um, part of what he, everyone keeps saying how um, the terrorists hate us because of our values, and I think that gets overstated a bit, but one thing that actually is true is Mohammed Atta, in particular all of them hated skyscrapers. He used to carry around a photo of the Empire State Building being built. He was angry at the skyscrapers going up in Saudi Arabia, and I think it would be a fitting monument for his grave to have an enormous, fabulous size skyscraper. That is what we do. We have flush toilets a quarter mile above the ground. They don't have chairs. He, he, he took, <laughs> Mohammed Atta, he probably took that picture for the famous meeting with the Iraqi diplomat, di diplomat in Prague, right? <laughs> what, what about this idea of museums at exactly the same level where the planes hit? I, I personally find this macabre, and I don't like it at all. I think it's insane. And in fact, there's an insane building going up at Columbus Circle right now, which is a monument to American stupidity and decadence and capitalist excess, the AOL Time Warner building. And now you're watching the the fruits of their insane business enterprise uh, going up. It's a twin tower uh, and overshadowing Central Park. It's going to be blocking the sun. What do you think it's, of this museum mad, thing? Mad. I, mean, uh, I mean, I think museums are they're the sum of their contents, not the sum of their height. I mean, it depends on what's in the museum and how the people are remembered and, and the kinds of lessons we're well, learning I, about. I don't know. Just, uh, just after the uh, September 11th, this idea, I couldn't go anywhere near windows high up. I just mm. I couldn't help imagining that plane coming in. And the idea of being at that height and, and thinking of that plane coming in at precisely that height, I think it's uh, spooky bordering on sick. I don't know. What do you, what do you, what do you think I about that? I kind of tend to agree with you that it's creepy. On the other hand, um, I mean, when, when there are natural disasters, I mean, people go and watch movies and try to relive what something like Pearl Harbor was like um, or an explosion going off. But I, my first instinct is to think it seems a little bit creepy. I think we want to rebuild and move on and not keep nurturing wounds. So how do you remember but also move on? Build an enormous, fabulous skyscraper and clear out the swamp. Neil, just a final thought. I mean, how much say do you think the family should have in all this? Well, there are rather a lot of families involved, and uh, I have nightmare visions of, of, a, of a committee the size of the planet trying to deliberate on, on a, an architectural decision. Um, actually, the real question is an economic one. Uh, if you really want to be a New Yorker about this question, you have to ask yourself, given the city is staring insolvency in the face, uh, is it something that can be afforded? And B, do we really need more office space uh, downtown? And I suspect that in the end, New Yorkers, moved though they were by the events of 9-11, uh, will re rediscover their capitalist roots and ask a cost-benefit <laughs> question about this whole enterprise. Not necessarily. And that's pretty well it. <laughs> TikTok goes the clock here in Times Square. Rick MacArthur, Samantha Power, Ann Coulter, Neil Ferguson, thank you all very much indeed. Join me at the same time next week for another edition of Manhattan here on BBC Four.